I'm Walt Harrison, and uh, I fly the Hunt. And it was uh, one of my favorite airplanes and spent more time in the Hunt than anything else. And it's nice to be a member of the Super Saver Society and to meet with old friends who flew the airplane uh, and enjoy the camaraderie <coughs> and uh, the opportunity to come back and, and join the people here. I was assigned to Myrtle Beach in 1957, uh, I believe it was about April of 57, and uh, they had just gotten the 100s and they had a lot more people than they did airplanes. And so we sat around, uh, twiddled our thumbs and built, built bars and etc. Uh, in the meantime to get checked out in the airplane. Finally got checked out uh, by a guy named Chuck Wynn, who was a great guy and a good, and a good friend later. And uh, I had a good tour at uh, Myrtle Beach uh, until we uh, deployed to uh, Turkey for the Lebanon crisis. And uh, I had never been, never flown across the ocean before and uh, it was at night and so the squadron commander put me uh, on his wing because I was a young guy and he wanted to take care of me type thing named Frank Fisher, great guy and uh, unfortunately they forgot to take the nose pin out of his gear his nose gear so we took off in the middle of the night uh, and immediately had to slow down to 240 knots while he was trying to get his gear up and it wouldn't come up and people flying by us just uh, said, somebody's gonna hit us just here in hell. And no, uh, they missed us. Anyway, we spent maybe six minutes uh, at low altitude burning fuel and he gave up and knew he couldn't get his gear up. So he said, two, you go join the crowd. Well, hell, they were gone. and. So I turned around and headed out toward the Atlantic Ocean and uh, I uh, wanted to use burners to catch them but then I was already low on fuel because they didn't dally around there and so we, uh, I did a combination, I got going a little faster than normal and, and uh, headed out east and uh, flew for quite a while and didn't see anybody. Uh, I did get to talk to them. Uh, <laughs> anyhow, uh, eventually I saw some lights uh, up ahead and the weather was good up there and uh, so I, I joined up and I called and said I was joining them and uh, whoever was leading the group said, well, just take the left wing out there. Well, everybody was kind of uh, in a big V and I ended up on the end of the big V out there and, bouncing around and getting whipped and whatever. And finally we got a little uh, daylight and started uh, toward the tankers and uh, we, we joined up and there was no real order of who was gonna join and what tanker and, and I hated the tail ropes and so you kind of just zipped in when nobody else was there and, and uh, uh, found a spot out there on the right to drove and those days we had the old straight packer and you couldn't see it go into the into the uh, drogue. And anyhow, we got joined up and the KB 50 J's would have to toboggan so we could stay there. And uh, uh, that was interesting. And of course, uh, the other element that surprised me, they were down 14, 15,000. We'd come down from 32,000 and uh, that's where the weather was down there. So, uh, and of course we had no radar and uh, all these things I never even thought about. Uh, but I'm blue 16 holding on and somebody else had to make those decisions and find the tankers for us. And, and uh, eventually uh, uh, we passed the tankers. They were going this way and we were going the other direction and everybody turns around and you, you turn around 
15, 16 airplanes and it, it gets to be a little uh, <laughs> gamey there. Anyhow, we, uh, we got all lined up and, and uh, took on gas uh, and uh, headed out. And then the uh, next refueling was near the Azores. And uh, once again, now we're experienced and uh, <laughs> we, we uh, find the tanker uh, fairly easily this time. And, and they had some radar on board and they helped us out. Uh, <clears throat> refueling went uh, normal until we started climbing out and my cockpit went full hot. <clears throat> and uh, I'd never had this before, but I'd heard a recording they made was too late, too late. And uh, this was a guy that, uh, that uh, had a hot cockpit, low altitude, and they keep telling him to jettison his canopy, but he's got a new camera back here that he's carrying along and he didn't do that and finally uh, somebody's chasing him and he just flies it into the water and they say too late, too late. So that's the first thing I thought of. <clears throat> but I'm climbing out and of course I'll call my leader and ask for advice, you know. And he says, well you can open the cockpit air and get outside air, but you lose compression cockpit compression. And then you'd have to go 100% oxygen. Well, you've already, already been flying about five or six hours and you don't have a whole lot of oxygen anyway. And so we debating what to do about that. But we're climbing up. <clears throat> I carry two Hershey bars, uh, actually uh, with the nuts in them. And they were on the windscreen, uh, or the screen, not windscreen, but the shield for the, and uh, they melted. <clears throat> and they were running, the chocolate was running down the side, so it was warm in there. And uh, I know I gotta do something pretty soon. What I didn't realize is, as I had refueled, uh, the drove back in those days had a big steel bar that went all the way around. And it had banged against the back part of my canopy back here. Uh, when I had missed it one time. In fact, it banged several times. You know? And I had cracked this canopy and I was unaware of that. <clears throat> and uh, uh, it blew out at 32,000. So cockpit temperature went down to minus 35 degrees from where I was. So I didn't have to worry about burning up the cockpit, but <clears throat> anyway, so uh, I pulled up on Leeds left wing and pointed back there and and initially he just kind of looked at me and then he gave me one of these. And <clears throat> so it turns out that the tankers to go past uh, Italy were there and we were going to have to divert. I didn't know any of this and uh, uh, we were diverting into Chateau and uh, it was raining like hell at Chateau and, and uh, uh, Lee couldn't land with me because formation landing and all the water on the runway was a problem. So at, at the last minute, I, I've got the gear down and I'm, I'm ready to land and I don't know where. And uh, he points at me to land and uh, he takes off and goes around and I, so I land and I'm on a very, very wet runway and I get a good shoot. And uh, anyway, uh, he comes around and lands with minimal fuel. <clears throat> so everybody else the next day leaves on the way to Turkey and I'm there with $10 and a flight suit and no clothes. And, <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> I had to borrow some money from people so I could eat. And uh, I was there three days, I think. <clears throat> They got a new canopy in, and they said, uh, you fly down to uh, Willis, Libya, and I had never flown in Europe before, and uh, nothing 
there were no tech ends hardly available and, and whatever. Anyway, I, I managed to get from there down to, to Libya and uh, joined up with uh, three other guys the next day and, uh, and we flew on into, into Turkey. But that was one of the more exciting times uh, for a first lieutenant. And, uh, over the years, a uh, number of exciting uh, missions in the, in the 100. <clears throat> I'd like to go fast forward uh, to uh, 1966, uh, actually 65 uh, Christmas, and I'm flying F-104s at Luke teaching German pilots. And um, they called me in and then said, you're being assigned to Vietnam. I expected to be going, and uh, but I'm flying to 104, and uh, so I didn't know what they were going to assign me to. There were a few 104s flying over there, but <clears throat> anyway, uh, they said, no, you, you're going uh, as a forward air controller. And I said, no, I'm not going. I'm a fighter pilot, 10 years service, got a lot of fighter time. I'll be better serving if I can fly a fighter. <clears throat> so I called everybody at you trying to get the sign of change. No, nope. they took 16 of us from Luke at one time, sent us all to be forward air controllers. <clears throat> so uh, I arrived, uh, well, we do jungle survival school first uh, in the Philippines. And I arrive uh, in Saigon at about four in the afternoon, get on the bus and go over to Benoit. <clears throat> they said, be down so-and-so gate uh, at five tomorrow morning. There's a convoy there and you're gonna be in the convoy with a Jeep and a radio. <clears throat> I said, boy, have I got the, the wrong world here, you know. And, and uh, sure as hell, I get down there. I didn't even know where to go eat or anything. <clears throat> and uh, a guy in a tank said, hey, Air Force, would you like some coffee? I said, boy, I could sure use some coffee. So he hands me a black cup of coffee, and to this day, I hate black coffee. <clears throat> <laughs> she drinks black coffee. I <laughs> sugar. <laughs> I got to have sugar and cream, but that was the best cup of coffee I'd ever had. <clears throat> and uh, so daylight, uh, we depart and uh, go about 60 miles and nobody attacked us, thank God. Uh, and we set up a desk at a rubber plantation and uh, shortly after arriving, uh, I'm out digging a foxhole uh, and my radio one is digging a foxhole uh, also. I get it done and uh, a Lieutenant Colonel, who's gonna be my boss there, who is also an alcoholic, asked me to dig a foxhole for him. <clears throat> and I said, sir, I don't think that comes with my job title. And I said, I sure hope I don't work for this guy too long. <laughs> anyway, uh, I'm there about a day and we have uh, a lot of uh, troops, uh, army troops are ambushed and we're getting a lot of casualties, but nobody's attacking where we are per se. And I'm there about two weeks, I think. I don't recall too well. <clears throat> and this is 1966, and we uh, uh, got there in February. Well, I get back to Benoit, uh, where I can talk to somebody. And I said, hey, I gotta, gotta get in the air, you know. And so I called a buddy of mine that this had been at Luke with me, and and he's in 7th Air Force. I said, get my ass in the air. I don't care what, but get me in the air. And I'm here at Benoit, get me the 100. You know. <clears throat> so I was back, he said, no, but you're gonna check out in the old one. Well, I never flew a tail dragon airplane before. You know, the, so they gave me about 10, 12 hours in, in an old one. And I said, where am I going? He said, you're going to Fook Vin. Well, we had another name for that, but I'll let you figure that out. <clears throat> but you're going to work for Jim Lancaster. 
This just happened to be the guy I was flying one of fours with, who was also married to a girl from my hometown. We were close hunting and fishing buddies. So I'll fly an airplane, any kind of airplane that I think will work for him. So we get there and uh, at the Fook Fin and, and they uh, assigned me uh, to a uh, battalion and I'm living in a tent on Officer's Road in the battalion. So I go over to my so-called so -called home it's got mud floor. It's got a 25 light light bulb and a bare cot, but I've got an Air Force locker. I could trade for a Jeep. I mean, everybody wanted that locker, but I've got this damn locker. And I go out and I get some shipping creek stuff and make a floor, and I put a receptacle in, and I've got. I plug in a fan I've bought, and I've got a 40 watt light bulb, and I put on a VC mattress and sheets and a pillow, and, and the and army says, damn Air Force, what do you think this is, a hotel? You know, I, I said, well, you guys live like you want to, I'm going to live as good as I can. <clears throat> and I have mosquito netting, you know, and all this stuff. And, and uh, the building next to me was an officer's club, which was no windows, uh, it was about 10 by 15, and uh, sometimes they'd open it up where you could get a drink, sometimes you couldn't. <clears throat> Everybody else lived over where the brigade was, and that's where Jim lived and whatever, uh, but he wouldn't give up his, <laughs> his uh, it's a nice room over there, and I don't blame him. And, uh, but it was wonderful working for him because he kept me out of trouble. He got me out of trouble, and, uh, and he let me fly the most important missions that we had. And uh, so I had a great seven months as a fact. I flew 610 hours in seven months. And uh, so I, I was four or five hours every day, I was airborne. And uh, sometimes uh, we would just look for targets. If we had missions coming in, we directed those missions. And I got very good with the 2.75 uh, Willow Peak rockets. Uh, if I couldn't put it within 20 feet of the target, I had a bad rocket. And uh, so later, one day, I'm uh, out looking around and you learn that water tracks in the rainy season could be seen down through the trees because sunlight would reflect off the water. So we had a crossing, a river crossing that they liked to bring in the trucks, park them under the trees and at night they would use the sand pans to get supplies across, put them on other trucks and move on. <clears throat> one day one of my F-4 pilots missed the target by about 200 yards and opened up the trees and I saw they had a truck park back in there and we put a lot of airstrikes on it. So they quit parking the trees there after we had bombed them there. But I knew they still parked tr trucks under the trees on the other side of the river to move over. So I decided I put an airstrike on them. Well, there was no airstrike available. I called artillery, and artillery knocked down a lot of trees, but didn't get the trucks. And I knew if we left them there that night, it would uh, wouldn't be there the next day. So I decided to go back and land, which is only 20 miles away, and I put in four HE warhead rockets in the, my little old one. My my gun sight was a grease pencil in the front of them, <clears throat> which I used all the time anyway. And uh, so the problem was that the clearing of trees at the river was maybe 150 yards wide. So the only time you could see the trucks under there was at the last month, just on the treetops, 
and you were going to have to fire and break to keep hitting trees and, and you know so I'm down there in the process of shooting mine and I've fired two and I found three trucks and I, I had destroyed two trucks with two rockets but I missed on the third and now I got one truck undamaged and, and I'm down there and all of a sudden I get a call says uh, old one at very low altitudes on the Sang Song Dong Na River uh, uh, come up guard champ. I look up and there's another old one up here about 1500 feet and uh, and I'm not about to answer him. <laughs> and he is uh, coming from Benoit to pay a staff visit to Foot Finn. And uh, so finally he gives up, he don't talk to me, and he goes in the foot pen. Uh, but meanwhile, while he's still up there, I haul ass south, and I know to the east, and there's nothing in the east, but he sees me going east. And I did that intentionally, and as soon as he left, I turned around and went to Benoit and landed. Well, Jim, my boss, he doesn't know where the hell I am. and and, and uh, so this guy lands and he says, one of your airplanes is out there shooting rockets and not allowed to do so at low altitudes, right on the trees and all this. And Jim says, I don't think so, sir. And he says, well, who's airborne? He says, well, the guy Wall Harrison's airborne, but he's at Benoit. So, so I spent the night at Benoit <laughs> and Jim lied for me and, and they, they dropped it. One more good one, I'll tell you. We got a new guy in, and uh, he had been an F4 driver, and they made a fact out of him, and he was standing in line in the jungle uh, with the army, and he got shot in the leg by a sniper. So they sent him to the hospital, and when he recovered, they sent him to us to be a fact with us. Denny Biggs was his name. <clears throat> so, I put Denny in the back seat and I'm going to give him a dollar ride and show him the whole area where you can go down they won't shoot at you, where you can, uh, you know. And I have to add here, we could do all this because they had no quad 50s down south in 66, early, early 66. They had no radar guns and stuff. So everything was uh, AK-47 type stuff and, you know. <clears throat> and so you could literally go down and, and shoot your M16, I loaded every other round with tracer. And I got so I could impact, see the impact and move it in the target area and I got, I got good at this. I killed pigs for Thanksgiving. And, you know, <laughs> chopper comes out, picks them up. We, then I had to clean the sun. Just, <laughs> you know, but, uh, uh, anyway, I've got Denny in the back seat and uh, we've done the normal hour stuff and I said, oh, I want to show you the old French fort. And this was a real fort the French had built. And they had cleared a wide area around the fort to defend it. So this was a free fire zone. If anything moved in there, you could kill it without asking anybody. And so I said, here's the old French fort. You know? and, then, and he says, what are, what are those two guys are down there with machetes? And I, holy Christ, I didn't see that. You know, so, we pull the power back and we go, go zooming down there and I call and I said, hey, we got two guys out here. Are these good guys or what? And they said, oh no, anything there, you, you can kill them. Well, I'm doing at least 120 knots in this old one, you know, and we get just about to, to these guys and they drop the machetes and come up with AKs. We had several airplane, uh, several holes in the an airplane, one between the legs uh, type thing. Uh, at the last minute, I hit full rudder and the airplane turns sideways and we got some more in the, in the tail. Scared the whole hell out of me and my voice went up several octaves. And, and uh, so I'm calling, we whip around and there's about 30 guys running across this clear. And I, uh, we had to keep them in the clearing or we'd lose them, and I knew that. So I called for artillery immediately, and uh, it took about two minutes to get artillery in. Uh, the first round, 
uh, was in front of them and so that, that turned them. Uh, and I'm on the air trying to get fighters in and we've got F5s with a 20 mic mic left and they are coming back to Benoit and they got gas and uh, they could be there in two to three minutes. <clears throat> so Denny's, I used to carry grenades, Denny's throwing grenades at these guys and we're doing anything to, to slow them down and I'm so busy I can't shoot at them but he's shooting uh, out, of, out of the back window and then grenades and all this stuff. <clears throat> and we keep them in the clearing until the F5s arrive. And I describe the target as they're coming in and I get out of the way and they're just having a ball. If you, have, you don't get to shoot the guys in the open very often. And, and that, everybody's screaming and it's just, boy, man, this, this, is, this is what I came here for, you know. And uh, so, we give them, uh, we count the bodies after, we count 25 dead, and uh, some of them did get away. Uh, so we land, and uh, uh, I said, Jim, you know, we ought to write this up. Somebody ought to write this up for some sort of award. We've been here three months, four months, nobody, we've done things, but we haven't written any award or stuff. So he says, okay, well, you write up Denny for the, for the uh, Distinguished Flying Cross, and Denny, you write all stuff for the Silver Star. Jeez, I said, Jim, that's pretty stiff, Silver Star. He said, well, if they don't like it, they'll downgrade it, you know. But, okay. <clears throat> so we send this forward, and about four days later, he gets a call from 7th Air Force. And he said, what's this award for shooting M16s out the window and dropping grenades. Uh, that's not part of, what were you doing below 16, 1500 feet? Uh, uh, ground, Captain Harrison. Jeez, I said, that's, that's, that's pretty, pretty bad news here, you know. And I thought I was doing a good job. And, uh, so, <clears throat> I gotta go fly helicopters for two weeks just to, you know, because I can't fly anymore. You know. yeah. So, uh, anyway. Uh, I, I don't like helicopters, and to this day, I won't fly in a helicopter. In fact, I had a near heart attack up in Sholo, Arizona, and they were gonna put me in chopper and take me down to Phoenix, and I said, you ain't putting me in a damn chopper again. You know? <laughs> I'm rambling on a lot here. I'm uh, listening, so. Let me, uh, <coughs> later uh, managed to get shot down in a helicopter because they shot the tail roller off. We were probably, probably. I won't go into all that today. That's, that's another whole story. But uh, after uh, six, a little over six months, uh, I get a call from a buddy in South Air Force, same one that got me out, to, out there, and he says, hey, uh, we want to, uh, do you want to go back and fly 100 at Benoit? And I said, boy, do I ever. So I go to my book, good buddy Jim and I said, Jim, I hate to leave you out here, but I got a chance to go back. He said, go ahead, walk, you know, uh, I'm not going to stop you. <laughs> and I enjoyed working with you all this time and whatever. So, so I go back there and I get uh, three rides check out. Now, I haven't flown them in three years. I've been flying 104s and uh, been somewhere else too. And, uh, anyway, <clears throat> uh, so the first ride, I have, I have been flying oh ones now. And it's a big jump back from 90 miles an hour to back to the hunt. And I knew where everything was. I did blind check, cockpit check and that stuff. But I'm in a TF and I'm in the front seat and uh, I don't make a formation takeoff. They, didn't want me to do that right away, you know. The guy in the back seat did the formation take off. And, and as soon as we got there, one and I get out there and I'm a little bouncing around a little bit and all. But we're going on a regular combat mission. It's just, you know. And, and uh, so by the second ride, uh, I've settled down now and, and I'm for formation take off and whatever in the TF again. And uh, everything went well. Uh, and uh, now comes a, a third ride. 
and I'm in a D. And uh, and I'm leading uh, an L, so I'm in number three. And uh, we we get out, and this guy's found a truck. And uh, but we got a low cloud deck, uh, maybe uh, two thousand foot, and so you can't hardly make a standard dive bomb from that, that altitude, you know. So we're guessing on how many mils of pressure and all this stuff, and, and uh, so. Uh, Pull off on a high drag, uh, yeah, we're dropping high drag. And I pull off and, and I look back and I blew this truck up. And I say, how you like that, fact? Well, in the old one, to transmit, you push the button on the stick. So I dropped another high drag about five miles long. And as soon as I felt it come off, I, I was in Paris. And I said, fact you don't have one long at 12 o'clock. <laughs> well, I never dropped another ball inadvertently. <laughs> but, uh, anyway, uh, I became a D flight commander in the 531st, uh, Ramrods. And uh, one day we, we had Ramrod across our shoulders and the great picture with this big snake and all that. And, Today I give a thousand dollars for that picture and I can't find it anywhere, but uh, eventually <clears throat> uh, toward the end of my tour I had a guy in the flight, uh, and I'm trying to think of his name now, a great Italian kid, uh, and he was a first lieutenant, and uh, oh, I'm, I'm in the early stages, but uh, I'll, I'll have to come up with the name later. Anyway, uh, we had flown a mission at about 12 o'clock that day, uh, and they put us on alert. And uh, normally you didn't fly in the mornings and, and then alert that evening, but this time we did. We ended up flying three uh, uh, scrambles at night off the alert pad, and I was a vegetable. I really was, and uh, but I had given him the lead on the last flight because I wanted uh, uh, him to get some time, you know. So uh, I wanted to see how he handled that type of thing. <clears throat> they sent us down to Fort Corps, uh, where a special forces camp was under attack, and there was a canal right along with trees on it and they, that's where these bad guys were mostly coming from. So they wanted us to drop CBU-2s. Well, it was still dark, but you could see a little moonlight reflecting off the water and a lot of rice paddies, which helps. Awesome. But flying at 200 feet at night, uh, kind of, I never had done it before, put it that way. And uh, we did a lot of altimeter checks and all that stuff, and and uh, we set up a pattern. I'd come in from one direction, and as soon as I was off, he'd come in from the opposite direction. So we had ammo on the target uh, pretty pretty constantly there. And the the guys in the camp were just screaming on the radio, "Oh, that's great!" And just, uh, when we left, uh, they weren't receiving any more fire. And uh, so, but we get back home and he's leading now. And we've got clouds in and out on GCA. And so you're in a cloud, out of cloud, in a cloud, out of cloud. And on the turn to final, I got vertigo something terrible. And he, he switched, he was switching me over to final approach frequency and I could not change channels and stay there. And I said, no, no, uh, and st stay this frequency until we roll out. And, and he did, thank goodness. And we landed uneventfully, whatever. Well, I was so tired, I didn't even go to debrief. Uh, and, and so he went for me and uh, debriefed. And then I, I was a vegetable. And uh, 
kind of like I think of his name. Yeah. Good Italian boy who was a great cook and he cooked for everybody. Uh, uh, okay. Anyway, uh, I I see him. Well, uh, about two weeks after that, I went home. He comes back to Williams Air Force Base to be flying F-5s and uh, he had gone on and been a fact up north and, and he was a bachelor at the time huh? and so he's now married uh, to a nurse that he met there and and, uh, and I see him in the commissary at Luke and he says, hey did, did, did you get that uh, DFC for that mission down in, uh, in Fort Core and I said no, I didn't. He said, I got the, he, they asked me, what's the best mission you had over here? And he said, oh, when Captain Harrison and I flew that mission down there, and, and, and in fact, J.J. here wrote up his award for the DFC, but I never got mentioned in that because I was in debrief or, <laughs> or whatever. But I ended up with uh, three DFCs and and the downgrade from the Silver Star. <laughs> so I don't have any bitches. And uh, I uh, went back to Luke uh, and they sent me to the weapons school. I came up here and flew the hunt in the weapons school and then went back to Luke and became wing weapons officer for the 104s and started flying out again. And, and uh, later had a, a good career. But there's one more thing I need to tell you about. It was a, a point in my career. <clears throat> uh, I had just given up on F-104 squad and moved up to the F-104 DO. And uh, they sent me, uh, they said, you got to go remote. And I said, oh, really? I, you know, I'm, I'm brand new colonel. Uh, um, where, where are you going? Where do I have an option? He said to us, Saudi Arabia. I said, huh, hey, I don't want to do this Saudi Arabia. Okay, you're going to Korea. I said, where in Korea? He said, Osan or Yongsan. Uh, no, not Yongsan, but uh, down south in Korea. I can't think of it right now. I'm in the early stages. Anyway, uh, he said, uh, Osan, what? I said, what's your job? He said, I said, it's assistant ops in the air division. And uh, I said, I'm a flying. He said, well, they've got OB-10s and you've been a fact, maybe you can uh, work out a deal with fly with them. I said, okay, I'll take the job. Two days later, the guy who had the job comes back to Luke and uh, he's full of And he said, General just gave your job to another guy who's outranked you by two days. I said, wow. So I called Colonel's assignments and I said, uh, you know that, uh, that bowl of soup you, uh, you sold me? I said, I, I, I had beef stew. And uh, that's, uh, this is some kind of rice stuff. I don't, I don't eat rice. So I said, what the hell are you talking about? And I said, I agreed to go to Osan as a sysnops for the Air Division. And the general has given that job to somebody else, and I've got a much lesser job, and uh, I don't even know if it's on the books. And uh, here I'll be a new colonel, fighting to get the control of the OER. I said, man, that, that's, the odds are really against me. And he said, I'll call you back tomorrow. He called me back, he said, the general can put you wherever he wants you. I can't do anything about it. Well, I knew right then I wasn't going to be a wing commander ever. I wasn't, I wasn't going to be a DO anywhere. It, it was handwriting on the wall. I said, well, I'm thankful for my current. So, uh, I, I get there and uh, I said, I'm going to stop at 5th Air Force headquarters en route and take one day's leave because my buddy Jim Lancaster now is working there in the headquarters at Fifth Air Force and, he, and I finally get to see him before we go to Korea. They didn't get that in Korea and they were expecting me and they sent a lieutenant colonel down to 
Saigon. Saigon? No, I'm in the wrong country. Seoul. <laughs> to meet me at the airplane, and I wasn't on the airplane. So that pissed off everybody there. <laughs> and here I'm a guy that don't want the job. And uh, so when I finally arrived, uh, there was nobody to meet me. And uh, you know, when I made my way in, into uh, into the 314th, and uh, I get I get there, and uh, they are talking about where you're going to live and whatever. And they said you're going to live on the hill behind the general, and nobody wanted to live on the hill right behind the general. I didn't know why, because he was an asshole, and and. Uh, so, uh, I don't have the eagle on, and they wanted the full colonel to be the ranking guy in the operations command post. And that's going to be my job. But there's, at the time, I didn't know it, there's not a colonel slot for that in the air division. So on the Manning document, I'm in the tactical air control center. I'm not aiming in the headquarters. And uh, I didn't find that out until later, but, but anyway. Uh, I get along, okay. And uh, I like my boss, who's a D.O. But in between him is the assistant guy who I was supposed to be. And then he's one of these guys that's like this and nervous and smoking. Oh, he couldn't make a decision about anything, and uh, but I, I put up with this for the year. Anyhow, I would go into him after about three and a half months, and I said, at the four month mark, I want to take 15 days and meet my wife in Hawaii. I get 30 days for the year. Uh, and he says, I don't think you can, the deal says, I don't think you can do that. And I said, well, I'll research it. Couldn't find anybody that says you can't split that 30 days and do what you want with it. You know? So I go back to him and I said, I'm, I, unless you tell me I can't go, I'm going to schedule an airline to go back and my wife's going to fly in Hawaii. Okay. Four months goes by, and he says, uh, and I go in and I said, you know, I'm leaving uh, next week. He said, we're going to have a, some sort of inspection. You're going to have to stay here. I said, you're going to pay, pay me for this airline ticket. I said, you know I ain't going to do that. I said, look, if my section doesn't do well, you can have my ass. But I'm going to see the wife for two weeks in Hawaii on this date. That didn't go over well with him, but I went. And I came back and my section did fine. There was not one problem. My number one sergeant, I told him my ass was hanging in this unit. So I, uh, I went, I came back, and everything was cool. I said, now, four more months, I'm going home for 15 days. And uh, he looked at me kind of hard again, and, and I said, well, went last time. And, okay, two days before I leave, they're going to have a bigger inspection, an ORI, MEI inspection. I've already got tickets home. By this time, I already know that my standing on the totem pole has just gone down from what it could ever be. And uh, the general, meanwhile, has pinned on my eagles out because he needed that 06 down there, and, you know. Okay, and Ann's getting uh, tired of listening to this, and this, this, this will be the end of this stuff. I heard it long <laughs> all before. Okay. So, uh, I go again, and uh, <laughs> uh, my section does fine. However, it was just kind of last straw type thing, you know? And 
relationship with the bosses and all that kind of thing. Meanwhile, I've learned that uh, the, the two star is not liked by anybody. And he has ruined a lot of careers and, and whatever. And uh, during this ORI inspection, uh, a member of the team comes in that I know. And I send a guy who used to work for me in 104s, who is on the board of governors of the officers club. The general has taken monies from the officers club and bought very expensive furniture for the officers club down in Seoul, unauthorized. So, uh, I let the major know to tell the ORI team to look into this. Yeah. Okay, meanwhile now, I have gotten an assignment to Hawaii as Director of Ops Plans. And I've told her and we're gonna ship all the stuff in there and, and I've got 10 days left in country. I've got orders, I've got all this stuff. And I come back from lunch, and there's a blue pickup truck in my parking place, which has my name, Colonel Harrison. And it's been there three or four times, I can't find out who's driving. Well, this day, it's raining, and I park my car about a block away, and I walk up the hill, and I'm not happy. So. My buddy Jim says, if anybody parks in your parking place, you let, let the air out of the tire. So I did. But he, he didn't mention whether it was a military vehicle or not, you know. But it turns out that was the general's courier vehicle to go to Seoul. So the driver comes, and, uh, and I told this sergeant sitting in the window there, I said, when the driver comes out here to fix his tire, call me. He called me. Here's where I made an error. I went down there and, and uh, he stops and salutes and, and uh, I said, you must be Colonel Harrison. He said, no sir. I said, well the sign says Colonel Harrison. And you parked here and you've been parking here over and over. You must be Colonel Harrison. No sir. I said, well if you park it here one more time I'll flatten all four tires. Well, he gets on the phone, calls the chief of staff, says, I'm going to be about 40 minutes late. I'm changing the tire. Colonel Harrison let the air out tire. The general calls me immediately and says, tell me it isn't true, Walt. I said, yes, sir. I'd like to tell you why. He says, you're relieved. Well, my replacement was all right. They only had 10 days at that point, you know. But I knew it wasn't good because he had take care of a lot of people. So uh, that's when I go get the guy at, to go to the, to the uh, ORI team. And uh, so the next day I'm in the briefing room with the general and he says, people just don't understand how we operate over here. And I didn't know it, he had been relieved. <laughs> He never knew who got him in trouble. But that night I get a call from a gentleman who's here who was at the 5th Air Force. He says, Walt, General Pittman just cut your balls off. And I said, uh oh. <laughs> he sent a back channel message to Commander Pacquiao. I relieved Colonel Harrison from his very sensitive position to pay for his immature and irrational behavior. I will never forget those words. <laughs> and uh, so I didn't have a job. <laughs> we weren't going to Hawaii. So I called everybody that I knew that might be able to get me a job and I finally got a hold of a two-star who said, Ninth Air Force Commander will take you and use you. So, they're going to send me to Sumter, South Carolina, 
short, this place where I was born and raised. And I said, throw me out of that prior patch. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, my career, which wasn't going to go much higher anyway, uh, I arrived there with uh, no job, but they gave me a job type thing, you know. And uh, so uh, the girl was Harding Gert, the three star. And he was, he liked to ridicule wing commanders and talk baby talk to them. I've never seen anything like this in my life. And, but I survived under him. And, uh, and there are other stories I could tell that I won't, won't go into. But I ended up uh, eventually working three years at Shaw, enjoyed it there, bought a home, her family was there. It did me a big favor. And uh, since I wasn't going to, be a wing commander anyway. Uh, I, I accepted that and I ended up going back to Luke to oversee the maintenance operation on the 104s and the German program and I ended up as the IG there and and uh, spent the rest of my time there. I had a home there and uh, my kids were there. It was a great career and I've never been sorry that I didn't become an architect. And, uh, well, I'm was, sorry. I never got that house. <laughs> she had two houses. <laughs> I married him because he was going to design me a beautiful she home. She had two houses. <laughs> That's the end of my 